Greetings, everyone. My name is Tim Burroughs, and it's my it's pleasure my to welcome you to episode to you to 23 episode. of EV Society's Canada Talks Electric Cars webinar. As we all know, the automotive industry is facing unprecedented and fundamental changes. In many respects, what we're witnessing is a major manufacturing industry that's transitioning from basically analog to digital. Consumers also need to rethink many familiar practices around vehicle ownership, including how cars are used, fueled, and uh, maintained, and purchased. Today, we'll be taking a look at uh, Canadian attitudes towards EV adoption based on recent polling by KPMG. Following uh, today's main presentation, we'll be joined by panelists Kenneth Bacor and Glenn Gary for some discussion about the KPMG survey and its conclusions. I'll introduce Ken and Glenn properly right after the main presentation. Please submit uh, questions uh, using the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar. EV Society member Jason Arnault will monitor uh, the questions and introduce them at the appropriate time. As is our practice, the webinar will conclude no later than 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. But before I introduce uh, Peter, I'd like to uh, uh, have you participate in a poll. And let's just bring it up. Essentially, what I'm asking the room uh, is, what do you believe is the single biggest barrier to EV adoption in uh, 2022? And you hopefully can see those uh, questions on the screen and uh, just dive in, choose your answer. And I'll monitor this, should only take just a minute. For those who are uh, watching later on on the recorded version of this, you will not see the poll. It's not visible on a recording. So uh, according to this room, about 27% believe that the lack of available inventory is holding things back uh, the most, is the biggest barrier. About 20% think purchase price is the biggest barrier. 15% uh, think that uh, the lack of charging infrastructure is really what's holding uh, people back. Uh, range, interesting, 4% uh, only of the room think that range is an issue any longer. Uh, lack of understanding and knowledge about EVs, again, another kind of surprising number from the room, I think astute actually, but 29% uh, of the room thinks it's uh, all about information. And then charging time, only 4% of the room uh, believes that charging time is uh, the big barrier. So that's pretty interesting. And uh, I know some of these questions will be uh, dealt with in Peter's uh, uh, presentation, and I'm going to stop sharing this now. Um, and there's a different audience doing these polls. And I think that we'll, we'll talk about that and we'll explain some of the differences. So, uh, now the good stuff, the important stuff. Today, we welcome Peter Hatches. He's Managing Director at KPMG Corporate Finance. Peter also holds the position at KPMG as Canada's National Automotive Sector Leader. Peter was our very first guest on Canada Talks uh, nearly two years ago when he described the economics of electrification at that time. Things have changed a lot, Peter will, will, he will address, I'm sure. This time, Peter will be sharing an update on KPMG's uh, uh, EV file, and it will be addressing recent market attitudes. And he'll be painting an interesting picture of Canada's EV trajectory for 2022. So on that note, Peter, hi, I see you're on the screen. Welcome back to uh, Canada Talks. You're muted, so we'll get you to unmute. Thank you, Jim. Uh, oh, yeah, I can hear you. Can, how, yeah, how could it be you. that, uh, oh, your speaker's uh, feedbacking a little bit. How is, can it be that uh, it's two years later and both of us look younger than we did then? Yeah, healthy living and a haircut. <laughs> healthy living, okay. I think you're, speak, you're speaking for yourself on that one. Um, all right, I'm going to get out of the way, Peter, and uh, thanks so much. Uh, we'll uh, look forward to hearing the presentation. Well, hello, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm going to take you through a, a poll that we did. We actually did two polls in reaction to the current market and current market changes. And I think, uh, and I'm hopefully you'll find this very interesting. So if we can, if we can flip through, I'll, uh, I'll take you through it. Um, and that's me. 
keep going. So I think Tim touched on this. And uh, when we refer to significant change or the biggest change we've seen in, in 100 years, uh, I think it's a little bit more than electrification, although it's connected to it. I think everyone in manufacturing has been alerted to the changes that supply chain and the interruption of the supply chain has caused throughout the industry. And what's happening is uh, major automobile manufacturers, whether they're focused on electrified automobiles or gas powered automobiles, are seriously rethinking the supply chain and the vulnerabilities that come with significant distances. And they're looking to change that. And I think as we change, as the automobile industry changes and, and the drivetrain in automobiles change, it's significant opportunities for, for Canada and for Ontario. I think you're going to, and you're going to see a lot of that. So, you know, we talk about investment and we talk about the big three. I'm referring to Ford, General Motors, and Stellantis, which is Fiat Chrysler and Peugeot now. You know, their commitment to spend $100 billion over the next three to four years should be convincing to everyone that we're in the middle of an irreversible change as supply chain adapts to the change that the OEMs undertake to make uh, electrified vehicles and change the drivetrain, um, it becomes a major investment as you can see here, and there's far more to be spent than that. These are just the big three. Um, and it will be a commitment that will have to meet the needs and requirements of consumers. And when we thought about it, we said, we said to ourselves, well, we need to understand at least the attitudes and the perceptions of consumers, right or wrong, you know, a survey, you ask pointed questions and you get pointed answers and a survey does in fact give you the kinds of information that you need to understand how people think and how the consumers think. One of the things that's happened in the auto industry in the last three or four years, and certainly since the last two years since I've been here, every single major automotive manufacturer has continued to earn positive earnings before interest and tax. Every single one, including Tesla. And the shareholders have become very accustomed to um, discipline exercised by the automotive industry in terms of understanding what consumers want and understanding what consumers are buying. And so this has become of critical importance because shareholders are expecting to maintain their return on investment. And so we thought to ourselves, you know, let's see what the poll will tell us. So if we flip to the next slide, we'll give you an idea, an overview. So we did two polls. Uh, one on general attitudes toward uh, electric vehicles. Um, and so we got a hot and cold reaction. I'll get more into that in a minute. And then we did poll number two uh, very recently as gas prices you know, started to become very, very realizable in terms of not how much they've risen, but in context of the general inflationary environment that we're in. And what do consumers think and feel because you know automobiles are a big expense and they're compounded by all the other monthly expenses that a household faces. So let's get to the results. <clears throat> so, you know, range anxiety and, and, and people talk about it. Um, so we asked very pointed questions about how long people are willing to wait for a charge. And we have to put this in perspective. Tim and I were talking about this before, you know, when you charge overnight, time, you know, provided you have that luxury, time is really not an issue. But Canadians think about it in context of, and I think North Americans do, in context of what they're accustomed to now. You know, they don't necessarily think about planning their trips or charging overnight. And maybe to some it's not available, but one in five, you know, don't seem to want to wait more than five minutes to charge their EVs at a charging station. And that's extremely important. Um, to give you an analogy, that's at the time it takes to fill up your car with fuel, gasoline. It's about five to seven minutes. And 51% don't want to wait any longer than 20 minutes to charge their EVs at a charging station, again, anticipating that they might be traveling a long distance and they have to charge at a charging station. So maybe they will, maybe they won't, but that's their perception. The other, the other interesting component to that is, um, you know, they'll think, charging, the, the Canadians believe charging 
anxiety, uh, recharging anxiety is going to intensify. And if you think about it, if you're seeing long gas lines when, when uh, gas is in short supply, people have that image in their mind. Um, and, you know, I've heard statistics that we might need as many as 1.5 million charging stations to, you know, uh, allay those fears. I think that's uh, extremely, uh, extremely unrealistic and, and, and astronomical, actually, because I think the technology will catch up. And as the chemistry of battery technology uh, advances, I think you're going to see these, these charging times narrow. Um, but, you know, the real issue is price. And we've heard this from a number of respondents in a number of surveys we do. You know, some of the um, electric models that have been available to the market, Tesla models, and any kind of model, not just picking on Tesla, you know, have been expensive or a little bit more expensive than a gasoline powered engine because you can buy one extremely economically. I think that will change. Um, I think we discussed the economics of this a number of years ago. You know, the automotive industry is extremely proficient at building things efficiently when it gets size and scale. And when those economies of scale um, get to working properly, prices go down and as demand goes up, you know, they'll, they'll try and meet that demand. This will be overcome. Uh, early adopters generally don't have as much price sensitivity or as a matter of fact, range anxiety and, and sensitivity, but this is the reaction of our respondents. And I think it's an interesting perspective. Now, if we move on, Um, you know, we talked about fuel prices and, and how much of a catalyst are they uh, towards EVs? And, and, and maybe this is topical, but it's extremely important because the top right uh, box and the bottom left box are actually very connected. And we were very surprised at these results. 51% of our respondents said they'll never buy a gas powered vehicle again. I was surprised at that. Um, and 48% believe, and this is, I think, very connected, that, you know, the new normal is here for gas prices and really gas pricing volatility. And when you combine that with the inflation environment that we're in and in the urban centers in Canada where housing prices have become extremely significant, you know, people are very cognizant as to that weekly, monthly bill. And fuel has become a very significant component of that monthly, you know, monthly bill, weekly bill, uh, if you're traveling a lot. Um, and so 72% of our responses said the current prices, you know, are an impetus for automakers to, to hurry up and start making more EVs. And I think, I think it's very relevant as to the market that we're in and the market we're going to see ourselves in, at least in the near term. Let's move on. <clears throat> So maintenance pros and cons. Um, I think uh, this is very near and dear to my heart. 82% of Canadians long for the day when they no longer need to take their car in for oil changes and maintenance needs. They must own a car like I do. Um, and you know, when you look at $530 as the average yearly cost to charge an EV, it's extremely appealing. And you know, we talk about education. Do, do, does the consumer really appreciate this? Have they really come to experience what it's going to cost, how easy it is to maintain, you know, what, what components they're never gonna to have to change or understand anymore. It's, it's definitely appealing. Um, so a significant portion, two thirds believe that, you know, a battery powered car is cheaper to maintain. They worry about the replacement costs and probably terminal values if you wanna get really uh, technical, what happens to lease values and what happens with the average life as we've experienced it in Canada being 10 years. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, the current, you know, battery technology has been reasonably good as, as it gets out to eight, nine, 10 years. We'll see how far it goes and how well it does, particularly in inclement weather. But Canadians are, are very much concerned about reliability in, in cold weather. As we all know, we face some significant winters and when you're caught or stranded in a place that's very cold, um, you know, it can have some, you know, extremely adverse effects. So, you know, we think about it in context of our own environment and what we're accustomed to and what we expect vehicles to do. I think people need to remember that and think about cars and the way we, we experience them now. We get in, we turn it on, it's expected to work. And the automotive industry has responded to that uh, by making the combustion engine extremely reliable. And people are going to expect that in any car that they purchase, particularly 
particularly in Canada and, and different uh, climates. So if we move on, you know, the, the charging infrastructure um, is probably one of the most difficult and uh, probably challenging things, not just to understand, but to overcome. So with 12,000, almost 12,000 retail gas stations in Canada, it's not a lot of gas stations when, when you think about it. Most people, when we reveal that statistic, they, they think it's quite low. And again, back to, my, back to my point, it takes five minutes to fuel your car. That's why it's quite low. Um, so how many infrastructure, uh, you know, how much do we have to um, improve the infrastructure? What do we need to do? How many charging stations are out there? Of course, it's directly related, directly correlated to, you know, battery technology, whether certain battery technologies will shorten that charging life, lengthen that um, uh, trip. You know, there, there's all kinds of chemistry that suggests that, you know, we might see extremely long ranges, which reduces the need for, you know, frequent charges. Um, so there's a lot of changes coming up. My own view is that the early adopters will find a way to overcome the charging infrastructure deficit, if you want to call it that, because you know they'll have vehicles that might be a second car uh, that they can use exceptionally well to do everything they need to do, and you know it can charge overnight or at a location that's convenient to them, and you know these issues will be overcome. The general population still thinks about this, and so in thinking about this, you know the government and manufacturers are going to have to respond to it. Um, you know, for, for, for sure, greenhouse gas emission reduction is, on, is top of mind. Uh, and people do think that, you know, this is the right trend. This is the right thing to do. The direction is right. Um, but, you know, a significant portion, 53%, they want the government to provide incentives to make it easier to buy an EV. And when we talk to OEMs and when we talk to people in the industry, you know, some are divided as to where dollars should be spent, incentive dollars. When you, when you create incentive dollars for people to buy vehicles, if they're not uniformly applied to regions, you get regional disparities that don't always reflect themselves in terminal values and you know, start to um, impair sort of uh, resale values or, or tradable values, that's number one. Number two, you know, are the dollars incenting the right kind of behavior? If all of those dollars uh, were spent in infrastructure, you know, you might have a very different effect. So to give an example, you know, the latest federal and federal Canadian federal government initiatives, you know, are talking about $900 million dedicated towards, uh, you know, infrastructure, 1.7 billion towards incentives. You know, maybe those numbers should be changed around. Um, I personally think that the automotive industry will in fact meet the needs of its consumers by making cars more efficient. You know, they're enjoying, as we said, significant profits. They've learned how to make a profit, although I think they're in for some um, uncharted waters as they as they change over into the, the new power plants. But I think that industry is best left to its own devices because they've proven to be very good at it historically. Uh, and they've learned from uh, the various misfortunes they've experienced throughout uh, you know, the 2000s and, and before that. So let's move on, let's see what we got. So um, this is probably the most significant challenge and threat to the major automobile manufacturers. And when you talk about disruptive change, this is it. 49% of our respondents said they would buy an electric vehicle made by a major technology company or a rival EV start, upstart versus an established OEM. Now, you know, we go through all these other uh, statistics, but I can tell you that that's probably the most worrisome and problematic finding that we had in this survey, only because the push for market share is on and it's on in a big way. Um, when you look at 62% of respondents would rather buy a car from a company that specializes in battery powered automobiles, you can understand, you'd almost think that Stellantis read this survey and said, hmm, we better build a you know, battery technology plant in Ontario. Um, and I think that, you know, as these new entrants come into the market, and I can assure you <laughs> that these new entrants might have extremely lofty goals and great aspirations and very healthy balance sheets. 
but it's extremely difficult for those of you who've been there. In the industry and whether they're in major part supplier is really not easy making a car and making a car up to the standards that north americans and all the global uh, consumers expect they expect tight tolerances and, and a good product so remains to be seen well where, where all these extremely successful it companies can actually manufacture a car and what the arrangement might be and who might be who really might be manufacturing that car but i will tell you that um it's very clear that as the game, as the playing field changes and the game changes, all bets are off and market share is up for grabs. Let's change over. So, you know, what do we see in the future? Um, like I said, I think I think pole position is, is really up for grabs. Tesla's in the lead, but Tesla's an extremely small component of the total automobile revenue even today, although it has turned, as I said, uh, into profitable earnings before interest and tax. All the major manufacturers have had good profitability, strong balance sheets, a lot of know-how, and everything is at stake. So the good thing about that from a consumer point of view is all of these hurdles that we're seeing, all of these, these problems that are perceived by consumers in terms of you know, infrastructure, battery rechargeability time, availability. I mean, availability is crucially important because we have been accustomed as consumers to have a lot of vehicle availability to us. And we buy heavy vehicles, trucks, SUVs. The battery technology is going to have to adapt to someone uh, uh, who's purchasing an SUV, that they will be using it on a daily basis for work-related items. And if, they're gonna, if it's going to be effective, it's gonna have to haul weight, for a long distance and inclement weather. You know what, there's a lot of challenges there. I think they'll get over it. But, um, you know, Canadians, I think are well positioned, Ontario's well positioned. Uh, and I think, again, back to one of the sort of over overarching points and overarching re uh, responses that we've had, you know, in light of changes to uh, what people believe is the new normal as it relates to the volatility in oil prices and the volatility in oil supply. For, for you know, economic and political reasons, 51% I'll reinforce that, told us they would never buy a gas powered vehicle again. It is definitely food for thought. Okay. So what does it mean? I think, uh, you know, we have a lot of studies that go on on behalf of uh, uh, OEMs and governments and municipalities and and I can tell you there, there, there will be a significant landscape change in Ontario. Uh, I hope we will see more reshoring and a supply chain that gets uh, North Americanized, if I can put it that way, consistent with the new, the new trade agreement that was ratified some years ago. Uh, and I think we're gonna be significant and see significant beneficial changes for the industry generally. And I think that's it. I think that's the end of our, our slides. Well, thank you very much, Peter. That was uh, that's pretty interesting. Some startling startling statistics there, um, and I think you hit the nail on the head when we compare it to our own little uh, straw poll here at the beginning. Uh, you can see the difference in perceptions, that being uh, current EV owners versus uh, prospective EV owners. They they, and it tells me that education is is key to uh, speeding up adoption and. And so let's uh, let's open this up to a, a conversation with our uh, our um, fellow uh, panelists here, Kenneth and Glenn. Uh, Kenneth Bacour and, and Glenn, can you guys join? Thank you. Kenneth uh, is creator, producer, and host of the popular EV Revolution Show, which you can follow on YouTube. And the EV Revolution Show is focused on the massive changes uh, going on in the auto industry towards electrification. Ken's a very passionate guy. I've known him for a good long time now. He's quite passionate about sustainability and provides a unique approach to covering this marketplace from a, a global perspective. So, hey, Ken, thanks for uh, joining us. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, yeah. And Glenn, Glenn Gary. So Glenn Gary's been a, an EV advocate since uh, 2015 and a board member of the Victoria Electric Vehicle Association since uh, 2018. 
He's their lead for research and government engagement with significant success working with governments from muni municipal, provincial, and federal levels. So Glenn, uh, hi, welcome aboard. Thanks for having me in, in here, uh, Tim. Yeah, great stuff, great stuff. So guys, uh, let's maybe kick it off. Um, I don't know who wants to go first, but uh, any surprises here in the research and uh, in, in the poll? What do you what did you think of uh, of some of those um, trends and uh, and uh, perceptions? Ken? Sure, may, sure huh? maybe I'll start it off. Thanks. Yeah, I, I wasn't really a surprise, Peter. I think um, you know, your synopsis of the information that came back is is generally pretty valid. I mean, there are some other polls that have some slightly different rankings of importance, you know, of charging infrastructure versus cost versus, um, you know, availability range. So some others might put them higher. But I think the general theme that you mentioned of basically a lack of, you know, education and knowledge by the general consumer towards EVs. Um, as Tim and company know, I do a lot of public outreach as well. I'm part of EVS and, and you know, along with the show, talk to dozens of people on a continuous basis all the time. And uh, probably I would say, you know, eight out of 10 really still don't understand what EVs can bring in, in the form of range, in the form of lower costs, in the form of ease of use, all these kind of things. So massive education is still required. And that's kind of what I took away from, from what you, uh, you had in those numbers. Awesome. Glenn? Yeah, it was uh, really interesting to see the, uh, uh, the contrast between the misperceptions of the people who don't know much about EVs and the reality uh, of the EV owners, you know, sitting here watching today. And, uh, that's, a, that's a huge gap there. And uh, as Ken was saying, it comes down to a lot of education, uh, which is kind of what we all did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Peter, uh, we're, uh, was just curious, what, what, was your, what were your thoughts about that, that poll we did? I, I was actually surprised with some of those numbers myself. I, I anticipated they would, would uh, trend along those lines, but wow, um, I wish I, I had uh, uh, captured that at, in real time so I could talk to it specifically, but kind of a surprise, don't you think? Yeah, and I think I think we've got you know a fairly educated audience. When you take Canadians as a whole, and I think I think Glenn's right, and and Ken, you've touched on it too. You know, whether you're an early adopter or whether you have an electric vehicle now, you're going to you you know once you live with it. And I have lots of friends who live with it. I don't have one, but they live with it. You know, they're using it in a way that's very good for them and, and is very suitable to them. So there might be instances where you know, it's a little bit potentially inconvenient right now, uh, depending on what you do with it and how you do with it. But, you know, I look at two car families in Toronto in a, in a, in a heavy, densified urban center. I think people had a, who had a second car that was an electric car and they never had to put gas in it or change the spark plugs or put oil in it to charge it at night and never have to worry about it would find it really, really neat. Yeah, and and, uh, I and 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 good with it. Yeah, I think that um, if you were to, uh, based on sort of kitchen research over the years of being in this space, I think, and, and I think Ken and Glenn might agree, we've all heard stories where people did that. They were a two-car family. They bought it. Uh, one of them made one of them electric, and then uh, it wasn't too long. A few months later, you hear them say the gas car didn't leave the driveway for the last three minutes, three months, and we're the, the house is fighting over who gets to take the EV out to, to run errands. That is a not uh, an isolated story, I can tell you. So I think that that speaks to it as well. Yeah, I, I'm going to add in. You're absolutely right, Tim and Peter. Um, I mean, I use my my own self as a case example. You know, when I got my first EV in Nissan Leaf in 2018, I mean, I I really didn't know what to expect other than I was involved and understood, but. You know, I said, well, let's take the risk because it is a little risky, especially for a smaller range EV at the time. And, you know, it just basically transformed the way that we think about transportation um, and, and what we do in our daily lives. And it hasn't been disruptive. I mean, you know, there was some talk about having to plan a little bit more trips and things like that. And yes, if you're going to do longer trips, depending on the vehicle and where you are, there is some element of planning. But I took the approach of I just want to get in the car and go. I don't want to have to worry about efficiency ratings and and calculating this and where am I going to go. I just want to you you use it like I do my 
you know, internal combustion car at the time. And that's the attitude I took. And what surprised me about that change is it wasn't really much of a change. It was a different form of transportation that was quieter, cleaner, instant torque, all the benefits. But I didn't have to adapt my life around the vehicle. The vehicle, I put the vehicle to use as I would normally put. And I think, uh, as you mentioned a bit, Peter, that once consumers have that experience, you know, they, they either... You know, we find a lot of consumers start agreeing, start really seriously considering EVs when they get the, behind the wheel of one and take it for a test drive, you know, and, and experience it. That starts to change that mindset. Um, do, do you have any comments about that? Have you, have you seen some, some uh, analytics or research about that? Peter? Well, I, I, I can tell you categorically, Ken, I can tell you categorically. When the OEMs commit to spend $100 billion, that's just three. This education gap is going to narrow very quickly. The other thing that's happening is, as they fight, as the OEMs, major manufacturers fight for market share, as they do today, they fight for market share on features and performance, whether it's horsepower or fuel efficiency or, you know, kilometers, per, you know, 100, 100 kilometer ranges or MPGs as they have it in, in uh, United States, one thing you're going to see is, I think, tremendous improvement in range. Mercedes is already boasting about it, foreshadowing their new 1,000 kilometer range battery. We'll see whether it really works. But what I like about the fact is that the, the automotive industry is extremely resourceful. It has learned better than any other industry, I think, in the world, because it is over 100 years old making the same thing. That's pretty long. Uh, they have learned that when they fall out of step with consumer demand, there's pretty drastic consequences because they deal with significant capital expenditures. So, you know, you're, you're talking about companies that have sales in, in the hundreds of billions of dollars of range, big advertising budgets, big R&D budgets, and a lot riding on it. So will the population be educated after General Motors builds its massive plant in Detroit, spends billions of dollars on it, puts all these new workers on it, commits all this capital to it, do you think they'll educate the people out there buying electric vehicles? I will bet you an EV that they will be doing a pretty good job of it. And, and I think what we're gonna have, you're gonna have the most fundamental change coming up. In our, in our statistics, in our, the best, the best production statistics we can come up with, and this is a KPMG estimate, we said, and now there's been a little bit of interruption, so I was kind of behind this projection, so I'll take credit for it, or it might be wrong, but we'll see. By 2025, we thought that the major expenditures would be such that the changeover in production in the factory would start to yield, you know, on average, maybe as much as uh, one in five cars being electrified or z uh, zero emission vehicles being produced. And, you know, uh, it ranges, it could be as much as 13% globally, uh, you know, depending on the region you're in, there's gonna be regional disparity. So you have, to, you have to take these numbers and, you know, mix them up quite a bit. But everything that we're seeing, and if you see advertisements and focus and business plans, by manufacturers like Volkswagen and Mercedes, you know, you, you get the distinct, like if you saw a Volkswagen commercial today, you would wonder whether they do make gas powered vehicles because that's not what they talk about consistent with the way Cadillac, you know, promotes its new products. And they're very good at this because again, they're spending a lot of money and they want to return on it. I think they'll get over it. The real question to me is, will the vehicles, will the vehicles sell? Because the biggest drawback will be a major commitment reduction and you know they produce cars they hope to sell them but they got to get economy to scale i hope they sell them and i hope they can sell them at a price people want to buy i'll uh, i'll jump in a bit here so you know uh for what major auto manufacturers like to say and, and what they end up doing uh as we've seen in the last decade has been a completely different thing uh 2014 i think vw said they're going to be the leader in ew manufacturing by 2018 uh that didn't come to pass. Uh, Ford and GM said up to as late as 2018 that uh, they didn't think they need to get into battery manufacturing because it's going to be a commodity 
and they'll be able to buy it off the market much cheaper than getting involved in you know all that dirty making batteries and then putting them in the cars so it's been it's been really interesting to see uh what they've said uh my question to you peter is uh considering how long it takes to establish those relationships and go from being the best maker of say a smith corona typewriter to building a laptop right which is a completely different animal although they both have QWERTY, qwerty keyboards do you think you know going back to making sure you've got battery uh, materials the expertise to build that together to have the software to use that stuff uh, efficiently and the hardware and integrate that all into fully automated lines do you think the uh, legacy internal combustion engine companies do you think that's a five-year, seven-year, 10-year, or a longer window before they start making in the one to two million EVs a year? Long question, I'm sorry, but. Yeah, no, it's a long question, but, and there's some very good points in there. So let's talk about the history of the OEMs. I think the history of the major automobile manufacturers has been tarnished by some big misses, particularly in the United States and North America, which affects Ontario. And then when I mean big misses, I mean Grand Canyon big misses, like misreading the market, you know, having vehicles that aren't fuel efficient enough, uh, lack of attention to quality, things that have plagued the industry. We all know they've plagued the industry because then it's introduced, you know, significant competition from Asia and Europe and everywhere else around the world. I do think that in as much as they may have called the market wrong in the past and maybe failed to react, I think there's a lot of dollars behind their commitments right now that, you know, if the capital markets are right, when I look at how much money they're spending, uh, I, I hope they're, I hope they're spending it on conversion of, a, of a electric to electrification because they're going to be wasting a lot of capital. The shareholders will be very upset. So when, when we talk about, you know, conversion to production, mainstream production, you've raised probably the most important issue facing the boardroom challenge for the OEMs, the boardroom challenge. The boardroom challenge is this, they're making a lot of money and they've made it consistently. And they've got the production of the internal combustion engine down to a science uh, such that it is reasonably efficient, more efficient than it used to be. It is, to be fair, uh, better than it's ever been. Actually pretty reliable, well, depending on the car you own. And um, and uh, very cheap in some instances, like cheap, like people people can relate to an inexpensive vehicle. I think you're going to see 2025 being a turning point. Uh, mm -hmm. So let, let, let's take let's take North America. So let's get that production down path. We reached peak sales of about two million units uh, a few years ago in in Canada, and let's call it 17 million. So let, let, let's just let's just use a number of of 20 million to round North America, like super peak sales, right? 20 million, 20 million vehicles, light, small trucks, SUVs. Can they get to 10% by 2025? Can they get to 15%, two to 3 million units? I think that's what they're planning. I think that's what they're looking at as they convert all, all, over all these factories, maybe more. It will be, it will depend on, uh, you know, some, some uh, you know, production, production timelines and conversions. And then once I think that happens, because you've got these four year cycles. So we're in 2022, let's say the four year cycle starts in 2025, approximately, and they're gonna vary by model and all that, they're gonna be introduced. By 2029, which is another four year cycle, I think you're gonna be, you could potentially see 40 to 50% of the production coming out of those factories being some form of electrification, maybe some hybrids, maybe the plug-in hybrids that they're kind of experimenting with, although I, I'm not convinced it's going to take off as much as a pure electric vehicle. I think there's more appeal to that because it's simpler and I don't have oil changes and filters and spark plugs and I, transmission. And I just don't have that. Like it's just a different car. And I think people don't love that appeal. The statistics would tell us, based on the capital they're spending and the commitments they're making, that certainly by 2025, it's going to be a big conversion year. Will, will they get there all in time? Anybody who's, who knows what a big conversion is for a factory and their attention to quality, that's required. That's required. 
for consumers because consumers are very touchy about the vehicles that they just spend fifty thousand dollars for and the, you know all you need is for a door not to close properly you know you get all kinds of problems and the internet and social media is alive with people who have a bone to pick with a problem with their vehicle the vehicle manufacturers are very alert to that so back to it 2025 can they get if we had 20 million vehicles produced sold so in North America, the United States and Canada, let's leave Mexico out of it. Can they, can they sell 10, 2 million, 3 million, 3 million vehicles electric? I think they can. Yeah, yeah. I hope yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, why don't we take a see what we've got coming in from the audience on questions? Um, Jason uh, Arno is uh, standing by there. I think he's, he's uh, indicating there's a pretty healthy list. Jason, uh, what have you got for us? Hey there, Tim. Uh, we have a healthy crop of questions. One of the top ones came in fairly early and asks, why do you think auto manufacturers are clinging to hybrid models under the guise of electric vehicles? Hybrids merely delay real action on climate change and create more gas vehicles. Why not move directly to ZEVs as the climate depends on it? I think that's for you, Peter. <laughs> Do you want to jump in or, or wait? Well, I guess we, we can all have our two cents. I can give you the answer. I, I can give you the answer that, that again, I, I think that the boardroom goes through in its analysis and it's trying to meet the demands of consumers in a way that it, they know how to meet it. So, you know, they, they, they're worried about, you know, battery or charging anxiety. And remember, you know, sort of the, the, the hybrids, you know, I've been around for a while when maybe maybe the the, the distancing and, and battery technology isn't as good as it is today and for its time for its time I think it met a perceived to be a consumer need and it allowed you know OEMs to to you know experiment with with battery technology etc you know quite frankly a hybrid is like a complicated thing to build you got a battery and you got an engine and you got a, the whole thing is connected together I mean uh, I, I don't think I don't think that's the end game. I think it was an interim step towards an evolution, yeah. towards full electrification. Mm -hmm. yeah. Kenneth, yeah, I'll unmute. Yeah, absolutely agree. And and you know when you look at plug-in sales globally, the vast majority of those are are battery only. You know, seventy to seventy-five percent. So the attitudes by consumers purchasing plug-ins today is already very much one-sided towards all electric. So I totally agree, Peter. There was a time for hybrids. There was a time for plug-in hybrids. Some decent plug-in hybrids that have good battery sizes, that there's still a good use case for those that don't want to take the, the plunge. But um, yeah, I think their days are numbered, but you're right. It's easier to kind of, and less costly to continue to build what you're already doing and augment it. than as you described earlier, that shift over to full electrification, which does take time. You know, I ran some numbers. I think, you know, globally, we'll get to probably 30 million uh, units by 2030, uh, as far as uh, what's going to be available on a yearly production. And I, you know, plus or minus, uh, there was a Deloitte that uh, I did my own numbers, then I read a Deloitte report, and it was at 29. So I must have been pretty close. And that's just based on, you know, what, what OEMs say they're going to be making at a certain point in time, or what their targets are, which could change. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Glenn. Yeah, about, uh, yeah, about twenty million of those are going to be Teslas. Uh, good luck with that. But anyway, yeah, no, yeah. That, that is their plan, uh, and and good they are it. they are growing to to meet that requirement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jason, what have you? What else have you got for us? I have an easy one for Peter that also came in fairly early, regarding the polls you reported on. Roughly, how many people participated in them? Do you you recall? Oh boy, I think it well uh, over a thousand. Yeah, and eighty, if I recall, Forever. Peter, eighty eighty six percent of that number. I don't didn't know the number of a thousand, but eighty six percent were not EV owners. Uh, there were some who a few were plug in, uh, plug in hybrids, uh, and the rest were were ICE. So it was largely uh, or sorry, uh, it was largely an ICE. Uh, survey 
Uh, Jason, can I just jump in? I, I know there was one question down the list that talked about. Oh, you know, I can just interrupt, but the yeah. number's over 2,000. 2,000? 2000. 2000 okay. Yeah. Well, it's a pretty big market. Uh, I don't know who said it in the in the warm up to the webinar that, but uh, what's the percentage of the market that's still driving internal combustion? It's very, very high. So a 2000 oh, yeah. sample is a good sample of that, of that market. Well, maybe let me follow yeah. on that, Tim. I know there was a question about the charging infrastructure and, and Peter, when you mentioned the number of EV stations and gas stations. So, and I've had this discussion before with other folks, uh, looking at your numbers, um, I did some some research as well, and there's roughly around 278,000 uh, plugins on the road today in Canada. That that's based on the numbers from 2011 onward that I could find. Uh, internal combustion vehicles are about 30 million, so that's you can see that disparity, right? We were 300,000 if we round up to 30 million. Uh, it's quite a disparity. Uh, when you talked about the EV stations of of 65, 66, I think one of the questions was is that you know, the number of plugs and the gas stations at 12,000. I'm going to guess that the gas stations is the number of stations and the average gas station has about eight pumps. So if I work the math on those and what I'm trying to get to is the availability, when the perception is we need more infrastructure, but the reality is, is that there's about 315 pumps, uh, 315 ICE vehicles per pump availability versus 42 EV charging points per EV. So it's about eight times better availability on an EV. And that's not even factoring home charging, because as you saw in the straw right. poll that Tim did yeah. at the beginning, uh, charging was the, probably one of the lowest rank uh, barriers that, that this crowd here on the call face. So, you know, I, I think when we start peeling back some of those numbers and, and talking to consumers about the reality is, you know, that the demand isn't there. And I absolutely agree with you when you said that we don't need 1.5 million charging stations because we don't, you know, even if, if we ramp up the vehicles at, you know, we're at 300,000, it's take a long time to get to, to millions and millions of EVs here in Canada alone. So, you know, when you, when you factor in some of those numbers, the, the infrastructure is actually pretty good and not a week goes by that. I don't think we see something in the headlines about new, more EVs chargers being deployed, money being spent. So it's all good for the consumers. And I think that to, you know, to provide that education will help with, you know, that barrier and concern. And to follow on there, Kim, if we've got uh, two thirds Canadians live in single family homes, one third don't. So if we take your number of 30,000, 30 million cars, 10 million people need to, for the day-to-day -day operations, need to visit a charger once a week. If you can service 36, every uh, outlet can service 36 uh, different cars, uh, at a, uh, sorry, in a day, 20 minutes each, then you're looking at about 500,000 chargers when, when we need 30, 30 million cars being charged. Yeah. So. One of the so one of the things too that's really difficult. We, we keep coming back to educating the public about about EVs and and what what they're really like to own. It's very very difficult, in my opinion, for people who've never owned an EV. Sure, even if they've driven one for a little while and say, yeah, this is a thrill, this is a wonderful experience, they still don't know the benefits unless they've lived with it for for a period of time and found out how much of a benefit it is to be able to, to uh, come home, plug in in eight seconds and go about your business and then start your next day, which is what they do 95% of the time. And if you're counting charging stations, how can you not count all those home charging points that represent 95% yeah. of the use? But, but it's very, very difficult to uh, convey that to somebody uh, through a brochure or a, you know, you have to take my car and drive it for a week and charge it and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's just, a, it's a challenge. And um, I mean, that's what we're, what we do at EV society, right? That's what we're trying to do. And, and uh, all of the, the EV uh, affiliates across Canada, we're all trying to get that message out in one way or another. I also sorry. Wanted, sorry. I just wanted to add on that. When you talked about uh, Peter, that the respondents about the the five minute you know pump, pump versus the perception to get the five minutes, but I when I talked to a lot of people about that, you're right. We have that you know 100 years we've been doing that almost. But when I say, well, is it worth you then waiting another 
25 minutes, let's say, if you want, let's say that 20 to 30 minute time frame to charge, is it worth you doing that if you're going to save yourself 40 or 50 bucks per fill up? <laughs> Because that's the reality, right? The, the, the cost for charging uh, or home charging is a tenth or maybe even greater, uh, less uh, than, than gas. But even even you go to a supercharger or a rapid charger, maybe you pay, you pay 15 or 20 bucks to go another 300 to 400 kilometers, let's say, versus, you know, people on the, on the webinar can factor in their own or an ICE vehicle. It's got to be, you know, $60, $80 to do that in some cases. So, you know, is it worth you spending another 20 minutes to save half of the money? And when you when you start presenting that to folks, their opinion quickly changes. I have to add one quick remembrance. Uh, in the old days, and I, I remember this so clearly, that I had friends who would drive across town because the gas was a nickel cheaper. Uh, and, you know, and I think about that in today's EV terms and how much money you save uh, driving an EV and people have forgotten that dynamic. Like it, it was a real thing. So that's yeah, anyway, it's pretty, pretty interesting times. Yeah. Maybe what we need to do is stand outside the Costco uh, lineup on Friday and say, hey, you want to change, want to save 70 bucks on your next tank? Yeah. <laughs> One of these. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't know what you guys are talking about, 40 50 and $70, because I have a vehicle that, you know, the pump needs three digits now to fill up I'm, my car. I'm, so, I was trying to be nice, Peter, you know. know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. I'm trying to be very I conservative. You, you, know, <laughs> you know, I can tell you, and maybe you now I'm going to show my age, although I was extremely young when I saw this old commercial, so I'm going to qualify it. But, you know, people get their ideas a little bit, you know, because they used to see those Doris Day commercials, see the USA in a Chevrolet, and you see the family in the station wagon driving across three states and filling up their car with gas simply. And okay, I mean, I think, I think to be fair, you know, if you have that in mind uh, and you want that convenience, if you have, you know, a cottage like many Ontarians do, or, you know, people in BC go wherever they go in the summer or, you know, to vacation, Maybe it's an issue, but I'm I'm insistent that you're going to see the development of as soon as you get, in my opinion, to a thousand kilometer battery range, all of that is lessened significantly because even the modestly long trip will be had in one leg, if you will, if you know what I mean. Um, and so as long as that other endpoint has a way to recharge that battery you know, you'll be able to get back to from where you came from. So I think people have that sort of mystical perspective in their minds about, you know, these long, grandiose trips, which my wife would never take. She'd get in an airplane. I'd be the only one driving in the car, but that's beside the point. Um, you know, it just, it's just not, I, I think this will be overcome. And I think we're going to be extremely surprised, this is my prediction, at how fast the industry adapts to you know, getting more range out of its batteries is the chemistry and technology. They're already talking about, you know, things that will potentially replace lithium and that will help that range. And I think we're going to see it. We've already seen the evolution in battery technology already and all kinds of technologies go through, you know, that kind of uh, periodic and consistent improvement all the time. Yeah. And, and uh, I'm going to add, I'm going to add that the only, I think the only real need, frankly, in my, my humble opinion for, a lot more range than we we can get today at you know 500 kilometers or thereabouts. The only reason you really need a thousand kilometers of range is if you're hauling a trailer, um, because uh, EVs uh, partly achieve those those uh, great ranges that we're seeing because they're built to be very slippery in the air, right? And if you talk to an EV owner who's had the experience perhaps of uh, suddenly towing a trailer. And particularly in the winter, yeah, I see you, Glenn. I see you. I see you. Uh, you realize that there's an impact, and that's a that's a low profile trailer because I don't think you drive with it in that state. But uh, you get my meaning, and I've had that feedback from owners. And and so a thousand kilometers for an electric battery has a place in in that in that realm for sure, for sure. Uh, Jay, uh, Jason, I think we we can do one more question. Okay, uh, Peter, these questions are primarily for you, but if it's not in your wheelhouse, feel free to throw it open and everyone else can tackle it. The, uh, the next question is, have, has anyone projected how many charging stations Canada would need 
if all vehicles were EVs. Uh, Glenn has. <laughs> well, well I, I, I've seen some, what I consider to be unrealistic projections. And, and I don't think there's congruency between, like I've said probably three times on this episode, technology and its evolution and what we really need. And to your point, Tim, people don't count you know, the charging stations that are at home. The other thing people don't count is that people seem to have this, this, they forget that if you drive a combustion engine vehicle, like your Gilles Villeneuve, you really don't get a lot of range out of it, okay? I mean, it's really different. So, and, and people talk about the limitations of electric vehicles and sure, you know, when you haul a lot of weight, it, it's not as, it doesn't perform as well. Or again, if you do think, that you're at the Daytona 500, you probably won't get as much performance, but that's no different. You know, you're using energy in a different way or in an inefficient way. And, and that kind of, it, 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 it's, it's affecting people's perceptions. And so it affects the number of charging stations. Look, right now, 12,000 gas stations times eight pumps or whatever it is, you, you probably, giving the math and the time it takes and all that, and if you wanted to have a, a absolute congruency, you need more charging stations than 12,000 gas stations if, if you weren't charging at home. But given that you're charging at home, given that you're charging at home, um, you know, it, it depends where the charging stations are. I don't think there's a good answer to this. And I've seen up to 1.5 million, which I think is very unrealistic and unnecessary. Uh, and I've seen this, you know, 60, 70, 80,000. Um, it remains to be seen. I don't have a good answer to that question. I really don't. And I don't think the industry does either. But the market will figure it out. They'll figure it out. They always do. They always do. Yeah, yeah. To me, it's location. To me, it's, you know, if you look at major urban centers like Vancouver, Toronto, uh, Montreal, Ottawa, other places, there's logical points where charging stations need to be. And I think that is far more critical, far more critical than the number. And, you know, real estate's expensive. In, in Toronto, you just can't go around and say, hey, I want to buy a new, you know, I'm going to start a new gas station or a new charging station i mean you couldn't put up a garage never mind a charging station like it's ex really expensive now never mind vancouver and everywhere else i mean you guys know what real estate's worth in major toronto uh, major canadian urban centers is expensive yeah yeah the core of vancouver there are no gas stations not because they're being extra green because that's a waste of real estate yeah. right yeah. exactly right yeah. exactly right Kenneth, any last thoughts before I uh, start to wind this up? No, I think it's been, it's been a great conversation and I appreciate Peter, you taking the time to, to present that information. I think we're all in the same mindset that it's a positive movement. We are seeing this revolution occur. You know, we can all debate the speed and the numbers and where we're going to get to what points in time, but we know that this movement has happened. It's continuing to move. Um, you know, the pace of that that uh, change is is going to be regional. It's going to be based on many factors. Uh, I, I think the takeaway that I always try to get people to think about is like, you know, don't wait for the thousand kilometer EV if that's what you're waiting for. You know, there are a lot of great choices now. There's, you know, 30 some odd new models that came out to North America on top of what we already have. Um, there's lots of choice now, lots of price points. Don't wait for, you know, the government change in Ontario to maybe make a decision if that happens. Uh, you know, start looking now and put your orders in because I think what we're seeing is the, the OEMs having a problem to keep up with demand right now. Yeah, good counsel. Good counsel. All right. Well, I think uh, we're right at the end of the, the, the cliff here. So I, I got to thank Peter as well. Uh, Peter, thanks so much for coming back and, and sharing the, uh, the updated uh, info from KPMG and, and maybe and giving us a chance to uh, poke holes and, and uh, I think more, more agree than disagree with, with the conclusions there. It was terrific. Um, and, and thanks, uh, Ken and Glenn, both of you for uh, joining today. Uh, great conversation, I think, and uh, judging by the numbers of folks who stuck with us right to the end, it's a very good sign and, and uh, really, really appreciate. Ken, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get you back, Peter, next year. Uh, maybe we can get you back for an update for next year's file. Uh, it would be appreciated. Uh, to the folks out there, uh, I'd like to just add, if you have any uh, comments about the webinar, good or you know, constructive, whatever, we really would like to hear from you. We always like to get your email, 
just hit the reply to your registration email and we'll we'll see what you've got to say to us we'd appreciate it um and jason thanks again you didn't get a big workout today but uh, we really appreciate uh, you watching that the uh, questions i wish we could have answered a lot more but i think we covered good material so uh, for the next two episodes of canada talks electric cars we're going to be looking at a feature that's appearing uh, on more and more new EV entries, which is uh, bi-directional charging. So this, this capability will uh, eventually enable your electric car to power your, your home during a blackout or uh, feed power back to the grid when the grid needs it. Uh, and it'll have a lot of other uh, very useful functions. And we're going to tackle it two ways. For the first episode on the topic, uh, we're going to welcome CEO, the CEO of Oshawa Power, which is um, Ivano, and I'm going to slaughter his name, uh, Labret Chiosa, uh, the CEO from uh, Oshawa Power, to explore how the grid needs to get ready uh, to handle bi-directional charging. Uh, so V to G, vehicle to grid. Uh, and then the month after that, the episode's going to pick up on bi-directional in June and talk about um, what we as uh, EV owners need to do at our homes to be able to connect and take advantage of that uh, new bi-directional technology. So mark the date, May 3rd, 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. We hope we'll see you there. I'm gonna thank you all for joining uh, today's episode. And of course, from all of us at EV Society and until next month, stay well. This concludes the uh, webinar. <laughs>